Well, that was fun. I don't think we've ever played polka on this channel before. I don't believe so. So we've got this all set up now. And part of the reason I opened with wanting to show you the um, bottom of this machine is it has a very unique uh, movement on the bottom when it comes to generating that zigzag stitch. Um, that motion creates quite a bit of uh, normal vibration through the machine, which, uh, you know, it's no wonder it's not going to be quite as, uh, as quiet as some of the other ones that have uh, the simple needle swing when it comes to generating that zigzag stitch. So I'm going to probably pick another polka and, um, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, do some sew offs. Uh, on this machine. It's really a fabulous uh, machine. This machine, if I if I haven't mentioned it enough, I think I have through the Facebook posts, but this belongs to uh, to Sheila. And um, very unique spelling name on her first name is uh, S-H-E-I-L-A-A. -A. But uh, wonderful gal that is out of uh, the great state of uh, Massachusetts, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Lenox, Massachusetts. And this is her girl. This is her go-to machine. Everything about this FAF 18 just makes uh, Sheila's toes curl. She absolutely adores this machine. And having spent some time uh, working on this machine and getting it right, uh, everything from motor to tension to electrical, the list went on. As a matter of fact, uh, I may have mentioned to you all that when Sheila sent... Uh, her machine, she also sent a list of concerns. I'm not going to read them in detail. I'm just going to show them to you in the shot. But that whole list there goes down everything from needles to tension to bobbins to bobbins case to the machine sounding like a truck to not being able to sew over pins and uh, uh, the wiring, the hand wheel, the needle throat plate. And uh, I, I just kind of giggled a little bit as I read it because I thought, only someone that works with her machine regularly is intimate about her machine is going to be able to rattle off that amount of detail. So I thought it was really cool. It really spoke to a serious partner with a machine that understood that machine uh, as well as the back of her hand. So, and um, a couple of the, before I jump into this so off, I know I'm kind of hopping around a little bit here. But before I jump into the sew-off, the other thing I'll mention is one of the other challenges that I found uh, on this machine as far as the hand wheel that Sheila mentioned was the clutch on this balance wheel was backwards. So I flipped that around, had to go through and do deep cleaning in there, make a number of motor adjustments, pulley adjustments. And uh, also there was an issue with uh, Sheila's bobbin as well. Uh, it had uh, a number of barbed issues, and it also had a slightly bent bobbin in it as well. So just a number of different challenges uh, with the machine. The other thing I was going to show you is in relation to these two bobbins here, is you can have bobbins that look virtually identical. I'm going to kind of zoom up here. You can have bobbins that look virtually identical, and uh, you can encounter... Uh, nuances with them. This uh, machine that Sheila has pretty much works with the equivalent of a class 15 bobbin. Here you can see two of those bobbins side by side. For all practical purposes they look identical. But when I measure them with the calipers there's just a slight variance uh, as far as the width, uh, the girth of the bobbin. Secondly, the inner circumference here that you really, I, I mean it's absolutely critical in order to wind a bobbin, one is bigger than the other. This one here will not, no matter how much you try, it will not fit over that mounting point to be able to bind, to be able to wind a bobbin. While this other one that is just slightly different in caliper measurements slides on beautifully. So that is the problem with aftermarket is uh, the the size uh, tolerance that they allow uh, when they engineer their products. It can be three, three one thousandths of an inch off, but that might just be enough that it's not going to fit on here to wind the bobbin. I've encountered that 
with a number of aftermarket type bobbins. And so, uh, you know, be careful. It, it's, always, it's always best if you can go with the original uh, bobbin uh, to go with an original bobbin. Okay. So, blah, 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 blah. There you go. <laughs> the only request that Sheila asked that I could not fulfill, in spite of all of my digging and research, is she wanted a needle plate that had the, uh, the markings on it so that you can do your seam uh, tolerances, your seam measurements uh, more easily. Couldn't find one in spite of how, how far I looked. Found a number of them that uh, would have the seam uh, markings on it, but they would not fit uh, these feed dogs. So that's, uh, that's my only uh, shortfall as far as that long list that I showed you uh, that Sheila uh, shared with me. Okay, so another polka song. Let's see if we can find something here. Oh, what do we have? Yeah, this might work. Polka is a real big thing in Germany. Um, having lived there for three years, I can attest to that. Um, but also it's Wisconsin. You know what I mean? All right, let me flip the screen around. Let's do a little bit of sewing with this FAF 18. All right. Okay, I think we'll start with this uh, elk hide. I love this stuff. It's my one of my new favorites. So we're going to do three layers on this, and I think we'll do uh, a zigzag. So there I've got my three layers, probably around 14 ounces of leather. And I'm going to go ahead and slide it underneath this presser foot. Really nice clearance on this uh, FAF 18. Really there's no difficulty at all in fitting uh, heavy grade material and multiple layers underneath that uh, presser foot. I'm going to go ahead and change this to a zigzag. And then we're going to zip down and see how this uh, FAF 18 does with a task that you've seen me sew on a couple of the other machines as well. All right, here we go. Oompa, 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 oompa. Wow, that was just a little too easy, right? <laughs> it's got to be the polka music. Perfect stitching on both sides, both the lock uh, and also the uh, the top stitch. Um, did find, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share those with you in a little bit. I, I wanted to show you, uh, for those of you on YouTube that don't do the, uh, still don't do the Facebook thing. You know, I'm going to turn your names into Mark Zuckerman or something. <laughs> no, I, I get it. Today is a different, th this is a different world now. It just is. And. I totally get the caution point. So here's our uh, zigzag that we just did through three layers of this uh, genuine elk uh, hide. It's absolutely spectacular uh, in every way. The uh, stitch formation, uh, the stitch spacing, the integrity of the stitch is just absolutely uh, amazing. And if you look at it from the side again, it's just a reminder of what we just went through. This is no light task. And again, if you have a FAF 18, Unless it's been to this workshop, please, please, please uh, don't take on and try to, you know, duplicate uh, the sew-offs that I do because uh, Sheila's machine, as you'll see if you haven't already seen them uh, in the Facebook shots, it went through an intense uh, overhaul uh, to get it ready to do sewing like this. So that's our three layers of genuine elk hide. I'm going to put that behind the machine. Now we're going to jump into my go-to, my, I love it, the U.S. Army grade canvas, but we can't do it without a little bit more uh, polka music. Let me see what I can find here. Did I already do this one? Yeah, if I did, it's worth doing it again. This is fun. All right, so two layers we're starting with. We go ahead and fold it in half. We're up to four. Fold it again. We're all the way up to eight layers of U.S. Army grade canvas. Let's try to get that underneath the presser foot. My goodness gravy. 
All right, I think we'll do a zigzag again. It, it just, it's fun to look at. All right, eight layers, U.S. Army grade canvas. Opa! All right, that's a new level of easy. There's our lock stitch and our top stitch. It just doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. Like I said, it's gotta be the polka music. All right, I should clip these real quick so I don't get to the end and like, ah, yikes. You know, with the horns, it almost sounds like music you would hear in uh, Mexico. I'm loving this. All right, let's do our gunny sack material. Here we've got, uh, we're starting with two layers. I'm gonna go ahead and fold it. We're up to four. We're up to eight layers of gunny sack material. And we'll stick with the zigzag. It seems to be uh, a stitch that this machine enjoys uh, sewing. All right, press your foots down. Let's see what happens here. Eight layers, gunny sack material. Oopa! Wow. Have not found a challenge for this machine yet. Not even close. So there's our, our uh, lock stitch on the bottom there. Absolutely perfect in every way. And our top stitch, absolutely spectacular. All right, I'm gonna do our last stitch off and just for kicks and giggles, I'll flip us to a straight stitch. Here's our commercial grade vinyl. And you can see it from the side, we've got six layers of this stuff. If I pinch it together, that's what we're contending with right there, folks. I'm not making it up, that's crazy. All right, let me see if I can slide this underneath the presser foot. Come on, you silly guy. All right, presser foot down. Six layers of commercial grade vinyl. Here we go. Whoopa. All right, it just continues to get better and better and better. Sheila's machine is like, has like a superpower or something. There's our top stitch and our lock stitch. Now, I'd like to say that I did that little curve thing for no reason, but I just was kind of throttle, throttling that foot control and just enjoying power and speed. And uh, there you go. And look at again from the side, the six layers of this commercial grade vinyl. You can see it from this side as well. Nothing lightweight about that at all. And just as easy as that, this machine just literally got the job done. Those are all the sew-offs that I had uh, prepared, quite honestly. And uh, this West Germany engineered machine got each and every one of them done with so, so much ease. It's just ridiculous. I, it's like, okay, what's next? But let me again just show you kind of what we just did here. We started with this uh, uh, genuine elk hide. Maybe if I put it like that, you can see the stitches better. Then we did the uh, U.S. Army grade canvas, I believe. Then we did the gunny sack material. And then finally we wrapped it up with this commercial grade uh, vinyl. I'm going to zoom in on these a little bit so you can see them. And... Uh, you know, I wish I had that little magical button that they have at Office Max, I believe it is, so I could hit it right now and just say, that was easy, because that really was easy. And uh, I can say with absolute conviction that Sheila's machine did not sew like this when it came in the door. Pretty much her list of concerns uh, will attest to that. So there you're looking from the side there, the three layers of a genuine elk hide and we did a zigzag and the machine did it effortlessly i mean not even a blink then we did our eight layers of u.s army grade canvas the stitching speaks for itself it's absolutely spot on i kind of kind of got that gunny 
sack material covering that a little bit. Let me move that over a little bit so you can see those stitches all the way down. Absolutely uh, spectacular in every way. There you can see that uh, elk hide from the side. The grain of that, that grain just screams out and says, try to get through. Well, you know what? This FAF 18 that belongs to Sheila wasn't intimidated by that cry or by that challenge. It was just like, <clears throat> done. And then we did our uh, eight layers of gunny sack material. And you can see, I'm going to try to really zoom in on this. Uh, that zigzag is absolutely spectacular in every way possible. Unbelievable how easy it made that look. Then finally, we went to our commercial grade vinyl. See if I can get this camera to cooperate with me. Look at it from the side of, of, of what we just sewed through. That's six layers of commercial grade vinyl. Again, don't try this at home, folks. If you have a FAF 18, if you have a FAF 130, FAF 130-6, it doesn't matter. Don't try this. You know, I love business. I feel very blessed to get business uh, from folks that need my help. But I'm just cautioning you. Uh, you don't want to throw six layers of commercial grade vinyl underneath your machine unless it's been specially prepared uh, to handle that level of sewing. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I really feel like I should do more sewing because I do have a, a number of uh, additional uh, polka pieces, but I mean, look at what we just did. All of those sew-offs. That quickly with that degree of ease on the part of this FAF 18. Um, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump over to the computer real quick and I'll take you through some of those progress shots that I talked about if I can actually find my computer. Those are some of the uh, music pieces that YouTube lets me use. Those are kind of up on the screen right now, but we're not here to look at those. All right, let me see what I have here. Okay, so this is the first series of photos that I posted. The first uh, photos, uh, progress shots of uh, Sheila's machine. And I'm going to have to kind of walk in front of the camera to uh, tap the, um, the mouse. So uh, you'll have to forgive me in advance. I'm going to have to walk in front of the camera just temporarily. And we'll take a look at these. And I'm going to move this chair as well. All right. Is it in focus? I hope yes. Okay. And I'm going to kind of sit down. So here's our opening shot right there. Yeah, I'm pretty close. It looks good. Here's our opening shot. And we're looking, let's see if it's going to go in the right order. Uh, is that the right order? Let me see. Yeah, I think it is. These photos upload real weird to, uh, yeah, that's a totally, that's another machine, but we're not going to, we're going to focus on that after. So, Sheila's machine had a number of challenges. It had, um, mechanical adjustment issues. It had a lot of clumsiness issues. This is looking at the back of the machine uh, into the mechanics. And you can see how, how they're out of order. I'm not putting the cover back on. I'm taking the cover off and they're just totally out of order. So here's the back of Sheila's machine. Just kind of showing you the, the look of the machine. Here we have that proud uh, uh, branding mark of Western uh, Germany. Uh, one of the classic machines uh, from the early, early 1950s, late 1940s that still announced that uh, very proudly. Uh, here we've got the feed dog control right on the front of the machine. If you want the feed dogs fully up and engaged, you go to number two. If you want them partially engaged so you're like sewing lighter materials, more delicate materials, you go to number one. And then if you want no feed dog pull whatsoever for free end embroidery, you go to zero. There's our tension control, which was really, um, it needed a lot of care, a lot of attention. Uh, and uh, had to totally disassemble it, as you'll see in the pictures, uh, eventually. There's the inside of the faceplate. Uh, just a lot of filth, 
um, a lot of uh, points that needed lubrication uh, and conditioning and cleaning. Now we've jumped to the bottom of the machine where you're going to see a lot of that dirt, a lot of that filth that had to be cleaned off. And again, because of the design and the engineering of this machine, there's a lot of pivot points. So you have to be real meticulous when it comes to uh, uh, oiling all of those uh, pivot points. Here we've jumped to the top of the machine. And you can see right in here just all the dirt and filth. This machine has been used a lot. It is uh, Sheila's go-to machine. Uh, so just through uh, the process of time and use and oils migrating, uh, it just needed a lot of attention. And there again, it's on a sequence. I'm not putting the cover back on. I'm taking the cover off. Uh, kind of a faceplate down shot. Here is uh, some of the electrical challenges that were with the machine. This is a contact that was designed to go into that plug point uh, junction and it just had a number of cracks in it and uh, the wiring, you can see this is all black tape and stuff. It was just uh, a mess. Front shot of the machine, again just showing the different control points. Uh, here we've got stitch width, uh, we've got needle position, this is kind of a pointless little adjustment that's designed to lock in uh, needle position. It really doesn't function uh, uh, extremely well by design. Here we've got the reverse uh, control. We've got stitch length and then again that's a different uh, uh, shot as far as that uh, feed dog uh, drop. Here we're, you know, we're moving into uh, some of the motor work that I did on Sheila's machine. Uh, probably one of the dirtiest uh, motors uh, that I've had on the workbench in a while. It just had so much filth, so much oil buildup in there, it just needed a lot, a lot of attention. As you can probably discern from that Q-tip swab there, that's only the, probably the initial swipings on it to try to get some of that stuff off. Motors are, are only as good as their electrical field, and there was so much stuff in the electrical field. Um, all right, let me go back to that shot again real quick. Um, this is one of the dental tools that I've uh, procured that really has proven to be incredibly helpful in breaking down some of that motor plaque that gets on those uh, brass contacts and on those electrical contacts. You can see my fingers here, I think in the shot, they're just coated with that oil and stuff that uh, is coming off of that motor. Did I click the wrong one? Here you can see a swab just soaked in that stuff. And you can begin to see that this is brass. Uh, prior to beginning that uh, cleaning process, it really had more of the look of being charcoal. Um, obviously, I've, I've talked about motors before kind of being a vacuum and sucking uh, all the debris and everything in their environment into that motor. There you can see a combination of lint, maybe pet hair, I can't tell what, it, what all that is, but it definitely did not belong in there and my goal was to get it out. So I'm using tweezers, I'm using uh, uh, dental tools and everything else to get all of that debris uh, out of that motor. There's one of the inside covers of the motor, just absolutely covered in that oily, greasy uh, substance that was really hindering uh, Sheila's motor performance uh, significantly. There you can kind of see we have the motor broken down. Uh, most of the parts at that point have been clean, but you can still see we're discovering more of that lint and debris that that motor, um, like a vacuum cleaner, sucked in. Just additional cleaning. We're getting a much happier motor at this point. And as evidenced in the sew-offs that you just saw in this Premier, um, that motor is just totally reborn at this point. This uh, motor brush on the left, that little stub, is what was in Sheila's machine uh, when, I took it, uh, when I took that motor apart. And this is the new brush that I installed. Um, motor brushes, they have to be surgically fit to the machine uh, and uh, this motor that, again, is, uh, um, is a specific machine to this FAF machine, uh, really it, it took a, a little bit of uh, finagling to get the right fit 
uh, on those motor brushes. Also here you can see is one of the uh, new electrical uh, contacts that's tucked underneath the bottom of the motor uh, to get that wiring back the way it's supposed to be. You can see another shot of them there. And those are rated for probably close to 30 amps and uh, we're not even close to that on this motor. This motor is probably right around an amp. And there what I'm doing is uh, after all the rewiring is I'm doing a bypass test just to check to see that that uh, before I finalize all the contacts and seal them uh, that that motor is going to fire up properly and, and, and run properly with the new motor brushes as well. Uh, also had to rewire a new plugging point as well. The other one uh, just had some issues with it. So that's kind of what you're seeing there. Um, that is the pulley off the motor. And I think I'm just showing there that we had to do additional cleaning on it. I think that's about all of them. Yeah, we've gone full circle. So, and again, as I said in the other video, um, this long expanse of photos that you just had a chance to see if you're not a Facebook person, um, this is only a smattering of the photos that I could have taken of all the different progress steps that I took Sheila's machine through. You know, conservatively, I would say with all the steps, I would have easily 100 to 150 photos that I could have shown, but we just went through, I believe, close to uh, 80 photos um, between those two sets that I had. I believe, and I actually have another set to show you as well, I believe, right over here, if I'm not mistaken, if it'll load. My computer is not the happiest computer in the whole world. Yeah, I do have additional photos. So these photos are going to focus on uh, the raceway and the hook system, I believe, primarily, if I can get it lined up. We'll go through these real quick as well. Let me see what my time is. We're getting real close on the time. I better hurry up with this. Okay, so here's just a, a front shot of uh, Sheila's machine. I've got it kind of elevated. Come on. So we're looking into the raceway. I'm going to click through these a little bit quicker. Here I'm disassembling uh, the raceway and hook. Uh, incredibly filthy uh, and a lot of debris in there. So here again, you're seeing the different components of that. We're going to get a little bit closer. You can kind of see uh, all the filth and the dirt in there. Cleaning some of it out with a Q-tip swab. I also use dental tools uh, as well. That's the uh, obviously the uh, feed dog area. Just additional filth and dirt and debris. There's the dental tool at work. I'm sorry I'm clicking through these kind of fast, but I know my camera is probably predestined to quit at 36 minutes and we're approaching that very quickly. Also, I'm using a special uh, solvent here to break down that grease uh, and then to swab the rest of it off to get a nice clean surface and then uh, to swab over it with a special lubricant to protect it uh, and to uh, maintain a nice uh, smooth movement down there in the raceway. That's the hook that we're kind of cleaning off there, and it's just uh, ridiculously filthy. I'm grateful that Sheila sent it in. Oh, let me go back to that shot, and I'll, I'll talk about this real quick. Um, <clears throat> right here, and it may be hard to see in the shot, but this whole area had been impacted by something, and there were basically metal shards and uh, real rough spots on it that were creating issues down in the raceway with that thread being fed and uh, and that hook being able to do its job properly. So I had to use a 2000 grit sandpaper uh, to uh, take those barbs and those uh, shards off of there to get a nice smooth surface again as you can see here in the shot. Uh, that took quite a bit of extra work but it was absolutely essential uh, to getting it right. Now some of these shots we may have already seen I believe. If I click through them, we'll be able to figure that out pretty quick. Well, maybe not. So there's a happy raceway. Uh, nicely cleaned, although we're still getting uh, additional stuff off of it. Our tension control. There it is, fully disassembled. 
each piece uh, cleaned individually. Just additional shots of those uh, pieces going through a real deep cleaning. And there's only a small sampling of the Q-tip swabs that I went through uh, in order to get that uh, upper tension uh, working properly uh, for Sheila again. I think these other ones we've already seen, this is the bottom of the machine and just uh, the incredible filth and uh, dirt down there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we've seen these. Yeah. But if we haven't, we're seeing if if we have, we we're seeing them again. If we haven't, then we're seeing them for the first time. So there's a fir, uh, full loop back to the beginning again. So um, it just gives you an appreciation, I think, for the level of surgical um, conditioning and cleaning and attention that I give uh, to each one of these machines that I have the privilege of having on my workbench. Um, Sheila's machine is an absolute jewel. It's an absolute jewel. And I know she's extremely excited to get it back. Um, each and every time she had planned to try to get it packed up and shipped was another time where we were going back to her getting another project in. She's, she's very much in demand uh, out on the East Coast. I don't know how far her work reaches out, but uh, everybody wants to work with her. And so her girl this FAF-18 is in constant uh, locomotion and constant demand. So uh, really a great privilege, uh, again, to have this machine here. Uh, and I've got to end real quick before we run out of space uh, with one last polka song. Did I do this one yet? Maybe. You know what, polka music is just one of those settings where you just gain a new appreciation for what a tuba can do. And if any of you played tuba in school, wow, kudos to you and your insanity in wanting to haul something that big around. Not really, I mean, it's like the sousaphones and everything else. I mean, they are just a beast, aren't they? But they produce a sound that no other instrument can produce. All right, let's take another look at those sew-offs real quick before my camera decides to quit. Maybe it already quit, I don't know. <laughs>